This is the 11th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we want to think about closed subgroups of Lie groups. And um, also, we want to investigate more carefully the relationship between Lie algebra uh, commutation and, and the, um, the commutation of elements in the group. In particular, what we're going to use that uh, careful study of, of, of the relationship between the Lie algebra and the Lie group to prove that every closed subgroup of a Lie group is, all, is an embedded uh, Lie subgroup. Last time I said something wasn't really quite correct as stated. Let's think about um, about a Lie group and um, and its Lie algebra. So we have our exponential map, and we figured out what this actually looks like in the case of matrices. That it really was exponential of matrices. We took arbitrary matrices here and then invertible ones here, exponentiated. Um, we can check and see what that looks like on specific matrices. Um, so what I said previously, which wasn't quite right, was that we were going to compare the bracket here and the multiplication here. We really should be saying that we want to compare the addition here and the multiplication here. Um, after all, we found that if, if, the, if we had an abelian group, then they exactly matched up, at least near the, near the identity in the small. So, so it's really the addition and the multiplication we're trying to match up. The Lie bracket is, as we're going to see, a kind of error term. Um, so there's an obvious notion, once you have an exponential, you obviously have a logarithm. But we have to be a bit careful. The exponential is a diffeomorphism near uh, the identity element. So there's not really a particular choice of what, how near we have to be to make this work. There's some open set where it works, but you could maybe use one open set, I might use another. And depending on how we choose our open sets, we might get different uh, notions of logarithm, but they'll agree near the identity. So we'll define a logarithm, which will take some unspecified open set contained in G uh, near uh, the identity element, and it'll take it to some unspecified open set in the Lie algebra near zero. And different people might come up with different choices of those open sets, so we get slightly different logarithms. But near the identity element, that'll be well-defined, they'll all agree. And after all, that, that, that logarithm is just simply defined by the requirement that it should be the, or the inverse of the exponential, and the exponential is a diffeomorphism near the identity, so it has an inverse. Um, then we're going to define a, a, a weird, um, weird sum um, of elements in the Lie algebra by taking an a and a b in the Lie algebra what I want to do is to weird sum them, I'll call it a dot plus b, is defined simply to be um, the logarithm of e to the a, e to the b. Now, um, we know that for an abelian uh, group, uh, the exponential is a morphism of groups, and it's locally a, an, an isomorphism. At least it matches everything up perfectly, the addition and the multiplication perfectly near the identity. So this will actually just be for an abelian guy, this will just be a plus b. Um, so if, if g is abelian, then we'll get a plus dot b is a plus b. And so what we're wondering is, how does this thing differ from an ordinary a plus b, this weird addition? Um, there are a few other things we can say in general before we try and get a, any kind of expression for this, this weird addition law. Um, we can say some obvious things that uh, zero weirdly added to zero must be zero because if you don't move at all and you don't move at all then going back here e to the zero is one e to the zero is one one times one is one log of one is zero right we're saying that this thing's defined near these guys and of course well maybe I should even say it that since e to the zero is one then log of one is zero so we'll insist that our log should have to satisfy that rule because that otherwise it's not the local inverse of the exponential. So that's uh, immediate from our definitions of our logs. The other thing that's pretty clear is that a uh, weirdly added to zero is zero weirdly added to a is a. Um, and the reason that's true is simply because if we go back to this law, that's how we define. This is our definition of weird addition. Um, if we go back to this definition, um, we find that uh, plugging in a zero for either a or b, you drop that out and you get log of exponential. And so the log and exponential undo one another, giving you these, this result here. So that's a very easy one. 
Um, another easy one is that um, if we look at uh, the flowing, um, we know that if you flow for some time t along the uh, left invariant vector field, uh, then you flow for some time, let's say s time time t along the left invariant vector field, you just get uh, s plus t a. We did say that in fact um, these are one parameter subgroups, they're actually group morphisms, and uh, that was something that more or less left you to check. Um, so, uh, and so it means also that uh, uh, since the real number line is an abelian group, this is fine. Um, and so if you plug that into our weird uh, operation, you're getting S A weirdly added to T A is simply S plus T A. So it does agree with addition, ordinary weird addition agrees with ordinary addition when these two vectors are linearly dependent. Um, so that's good. We're getting closer. Um, so let's try and expand out our weird operation into a Taylor series expansion. It is, after all, defined in a vector space. Let's remember, weird, uh, weird sum, sums are defined for vectors in the tangent space, in the Lie algebra. So those are the, this is all going on inside the Lie algebra. There's no Lie group visible in the story. We're taking an A and a B in the Lie algebra. Um, and uh, as long as the, the story makes sense, so as long as they're, they may be not in a whole, the whole Lie algebra really may be in some open subset of the Lie algebra so that we can have our logarithms well defined um, and they're mapping to some weird sum which is also in the Lie algebra maybe in that same open set it they're only really it's only defined for small vectors um, okay so we've got this weird sum and we want to expand it in a Taylor series how do we do it um, well let's take a look um, suppose we write it out as uh, well, it's got to start at zero um, because it takes, because if we said it, if you take zero weirdly added to zero, you get zero. So you weirdly add two vectors that are small, um, then their sum is zero plus correction terms. We use ordinary plus for that because we're in a vector space or in this Lie algebra, which is a vector space finite dimensional. So we use ordinary addition there. We use an ordinary Taylor series expansion. We'll get a linear term in A, which we haven't worked out what that is yet, but we'll see and then a linear term in B, and then plus, we have to work out some kind of uh, quadratic in A. There'll be quadratic terms in the entries of A. If you think of A as a vector in a Lie algebra, it has some entries. So there'll be some quadratic in A, and there'll be quadratic in A and B, linear in A, uh, linear in B, and quadratic in B, and so on and so forth, all the way up forever. Okay, so that'll be our Taylor series expansion. Now, let's take a look at what that would look like if we tried to do that weird that weird summation Taylor expansion. Um, and we look at um, the cases that we know. We've already worked out a few cases where we could calculate out this weird sum. Um, consider S A weird sum T A we said was S plus T A. Again, this is only really when the S and the T are small enough for this to make sense in some little tiny open neighborhood, but that's all right. So we've got a weird sum. We know how to do this one, but we compare it to, it had to be zero plus there was a linear in S A in the first one, plus there was a linear in the second one, plus uh, there was a quadratic in the first one, in S A plus um, dot 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 dot. Okay, so um, so there's all these other terms, right? Um, uh, but you can compare uh, powers of S. Um, this answer has to be S plus T A, so it has to be uh, S A plus T A um, in ordinary addition of vectors in our Lie algebra G in our uh, tangent space at the identity. So this uh, so this is ordinary addition in, in vector space. And this is some weird addition, which we've expanded out. But the linear term in S has to be the linear term in S, the linear term in T has to be the linear term in T. And so what we find is that uh, the linear uh, uh, term in A is A. Um, the linear term in B is B, because it has to be the linear term in T A has to be T A for any A and T. So that's how we can work that stuff out. So this gives us the following now uh, simple expression that um, if we weirdly sum uh, two, uh, two uh, 
vectors um, by first uh, exponentiating them into the group and then logarithming them back to, uh, back to the Lie algebra, we get A, we get B, because we worked out the linear terms. Plus, um, well, there's no quadratic term because there was no quadratic term here and there's no S squared term. So that quadratic term vanishes. So there's nothing quadratic in, in A. Um, however, there could be a bilinear term in A and B, okay, that's still possible. We don't know, because we didn't come up with any expression for any bilinear terms. Um, we know that if there's a bilinear term, it's got to vanish when you plug in A, A into it, because it didn't show up here. But this analysis is not good enough to see the bilinear term. It doesn't tell us what the bilinear term is, because it could be something that just happens to vanish when B equals A. So it doesn't necessarily um, uh, identify the bilinear term, but it does tell us that there's no um, there's no uh, quadratic term in B, there's no um, cubic term in A, and so on and so forth. So we get a lot of other terms uh, knocked out. But we'll just for now just write this. Let's see if we can work out what those what the, what this term is. Again, what we're doing is we're taking. Let's remind ourselves what is this weird sum? It's the logarithm of the exponentials. So you take exponentials, you get see into some nonlinear group, uh, some non-abelian group, and then you logarithm again. And uh, so you should maybe feel somehow that this is non-abelian by something showing up somewhere. Let's see if we can figure out where do we come across the, how do we cut across the bilinear term? Okay, so how do we do this? Well, um, to compute this bilinear term, what we're going to go uh, do is go right back and think about the, the, the relationship between Lie group and Lie algebra, that we had this Lie algebra and then we exponentiated it down to this Lie group, which I always draw as something like this. Um, and zero went to the identity element. Some neighborhood of zero went to some neighborhood of the identity. Um, so this means that there, ha there were vector fields over here, which were these various vector fields. This is our group G. There were various vector fields like this. And so we can define the corresponding vector fields on well, some open subset. I can never really work on the whole Lie algebra, but on the open subset where I have logarithms. So my logarithms go back, then they're only defined in some region. Um, you can really check in serious examples that logarithms aren't globally defined. Um, so there are examples in the notes that show you the difficulty of making a global logarithm. But there's a local logarithm. It's a global exponential local logarithm, logarithm near the identity. So uh, so now we're going to define this, uh, define these vector fields by uh, requiring that they should um, be uh, the derivative under our logarithm map of the ones on G. So this is on the group G, and this is on the Lie algebra, or at least on some open set or in the Lie algebra. And then because these are mapped by a diffeomorphism, it automatically follows that the brackets work out. We get the brackets of uh, the vector fields on G um, correspond to the ones on the capital G, which was um, of course, the bracket in the Lie algebra, and then the corresponding vector field. So it's uh, so this is this is also in G. Okay, so we're saying everything's now computed in the Lie algebra. We have globally defined vector fields. They're defined by defining them on the group and then using the logarithm to pull them back again to the to the Lie algebra. And their brackets have to correspond to the brackets in the group, which is just taking the bracket as a as an algebra in the Lie algebra not vector fields in the Lie algebra, just, just elements of the Lie algebra applying the bracket of the Lie algebra, um, and then uh, taking the corresponding vector field. Now, we, we don't know a lot about these vector fields, these strange vector fields on the Lie algebra. We know a little bit. Well, we don't need to know a lot. We know a little bit. We know that their flows have to correspond to flows. So, um, so we need to say then that the flow um, uh, of this guy through a point in the um, let's say in, this is all being carried out in the Lie algebra, and then we exponentiate that into the Lie group. Um, this is the flow of a vector field. This is exponential in the group. It's a bit confusing because there's more than one of them now. Um, that it has to match up uh, with the flow in the Lie group because the vector fields match up, their flows match up. And so this has to be e to the a uh, times one in the group. Um, so if we differentiate this fact as, as a becomes uh, multiplied by some small parameter, um, say put t a instead of a and differentiate, you'll get that exponential uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, matching, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, you get, uh, what do I want to say? We've already worked out, I want to say, we've worked out that the exponential of A is A. Um, we've already done that. And so uh, the exponential, um, uh, the vector field up on the Lie algebra, in the Lie algebra, which we've called by this name, has to add zero be equal to A, um, because that happens on the group. Um, and so uh, so we do get then the bracket of vector fields up in the Lie algebra at the origin must be a B bracket of the of the vectors in the this is in the uh, Lie algebra bracket. Okay, so now we've got uh, the bracket of vector fields worked out, and so um, so the flow um, in G of one of these vector fields, let's say e to the let's say of this left invariant vector field is um, e to the t a of each element is the element multiplied by exponential of ta, and that's exponential in the sense of the Lie group operations. Um, so we can calculate out that um, exponential ta of exponential tb, in the two different senses, this is flowing this vector field, and this is just calculating that the, the element of the Lie group corresponding to this element of Lie algebra. Um, sorry, don't, don't need the t here, um, is equal to exponential of b, exponential of ta. Note the weird change of sign. This exponential ordering has changed because this guy was flowing that element. These are different operations. That exponential and that exponential are different ones. This is the flow of a vector field, and this is the exponential in the, in the sense of the, of the Lie group theory. If we then take log applied to both sides of this equation, we get that up in the Lie algebra G, we get this guy is um, uh, is B weird summed to T A. So we can actually calculate out uh, one example of uh, how to find a weird sum. It looks like that. Uh, let's extend the weird sum to tr a triple sum by simply defining A weird sum B weird sum C is defined to be that we do the, the first ones first. Um, so we'll do A weird sum B. That's by definition. Um, when I write a triple weird sum, I always mean to do the first two. I have to have an order. You have to pick some order. It doesn't matter which one you pick, as long as you pick one of them. Um, so we can then use this same law here, and we can compose flows. We can say that... Um, that uh, e to the uh, minus t b vector field, e to the minus s a vector field. We need to bracket, so we need to actually compute this thing out by uh, plugging together some vector fields. S, this is s a um, applied to zero. This is all in the Lie algebra. None of this is in the Lie group here. We're entirely in the Lie algebra is by using this law for how to unwind a flow on an element that it's a weird sum, we can compute this out and we get a weird sum. It's S A uh, plus weirdly uh, T B plus weirdly uh, minus S A which would be weird. Um, okay. Plus uh, weirdly uh, minus T B you have to sum them in the right order. You do them this order, but that means you have to undo them that order to to get them into the into the weird sum, um, following a rule uh, here. So um, so then finally we can just bracket, um, and we find that um, uh, this guy must be. We know how to do brackets of vector fields, and so we can compute out this bracket of vector fields. It is in fact. Um, um, that this weird sum has to be um, st times bracket ab um, plus something of higher order, of cubic order. Because um, we know, what do we know? How did we get that? We know that um, if we, um, so if we use our formula for Lie brackets of vector fields, 
applied at a point, we know that this expression, which we've seen before when we talked just about Lie brackets of vector fields, that we knew if we went a little bit a, a little bit b, a little backwards on a, a little backwards on b, we calculated that bracket, and there it is. That's our bracket calculating out. Okay, so finally we can put it all together and we get that this uh, is how we calculate out our weird brackets. And that gives us the, the, the bilinear term in the weird bracket right here. So that's as hard as it's going to get today, I hope. Um, and that, um, that's quite a difficult piece of work. That weird sum idea gives us uh, that we've got a kind of deformed um, operation, the, the Lie group um, multiplication. When viewed from the point of view of the exponential map, coming from the Lie algebra, it looks like a weird sum. Um, so we have this Lie algebra going to this Lie group. And only near the identity does it actually have a decent image. Some, some little piece of it gets mapped nicely onto some little piece of this guy. Um, and what we've then done is to use, so this is our exponential, Lie algebra, Lie group. And we've tried to take the operation of multiplication here and pull it back to here by defining it the weird sum um, to be given by multiplying, going forward, multiplying together, and then going backward again. And we found that we could expand it out. And it, it means that this, this weird sum really is the multiplication in the Lie group viewed from the point of view of the Lie algebra, viewed under this diffeomorphism of the exponential map. When you stand in the Lie algebra and use the exponential to identify your Lie algebra with the Lie group, what you see of the Lie group multiplication is this, this thing, which I've called a weird sum. Um, and we've expanded it out and found that it is essentially given by the um, addition, but plus a correction term given by the bracket and plus higher order correction terms, um, which can all be computed out, but we won't need them. We won't really need anything more than that. Um, this makes it easy to prove certain basic facts about how uh, multiplications work in, in, in the Lie group. This is the so-called Trotter product formula. Um, uh, so it's that e to the a plus b. We can calculate out the ordinary sum um, in terms of the weird sum uh, as the limit. Uh, as we make a large number of a little bit of b and a little bit of a um, uh, done a large number of times. Um, uh, and, and the proof is really just um, that uh, if we take uh, if, if we take logarithms of the appropriate things, we're really looking at an expression that looks like this. I want to take I want to take do this guy. I want to do I'll take a logarithm of that. It's going to look like a weird sum, but to a large power um, multiplied a bunch, bunch of times. Um, and uh, and if you do that, it's just going to be um, k times. A over k plus B over k. We expand out a weird sum in terms of ordinary sums, plus a half the bracket, plus more and more terms. Um, and so we can um, say that that's really just A plus B plus, um, well, there's going to just be, um, what am I doing? Okay, yeah, there's going to be a k, a k, and a k. So there's only one k left over, A, B plus higher order terms, and so um, uh, this goes to zero, and that's all we have to deal with. Um, so it's it's very straightforward to prove that, that this thing works. Um, okay, so that's the Trotter product formula, and um, we want a similar formula uh, that goes on um, uh, to calculate out, not this is calculating out a sum in terms of, of, of brackets. I want to calculate a bracket um, in terms of brackets, or in terms of small brackets. Um, so I don't know the name for this one, but um, the, oh, so yeah, I've got it here. It's called the commutator formula, um, and it says that uh, e to the bracket of a b. So I can calculate the bracket uh, exponential in terms of um, there's a limit of uh, of k going to infinity of you take a little bit of a exponentiate, you take a little bit of b and exponentiate. There's a bracket here. What does that mean? Um, where this bracket um, means the bracket of x, y is in the group with bracket just means x, y, x inverse, y inverse, the usual bracket in a 
in a group. In any group, that's usually how we write a bracket. Um, so that's this bracket here. It's bracketing group elements. So using only brackets of group elements, I can calculate the bracket uh, in the Lie algebra. So we can see that we can recover from the group, we can cover the Lie algebra, and from the Lie algebra, we can cover the group. So, um, so we've got, or at least the identity element, uh, the identity component of the group. Okay, so we've got um, um, a formula for the Lie bracket, and the proof is is very similar. Um, you essentially just write out the weird, um, the weird uh, fact that uh, under weird sums, um, if you weird sum um, little bits of a's and b's, that corresponds to bracketing in the group. Because the weird sum corresponds to the group operation, so this is going to correspond to this side over here, um, this group operation. But now we can just ca calculate out by plugging into our our formula for um, for how we calculate out weird sums. Uh, this just becomes the bracket a b over k squared plus some higher order terms, which we don't really need to worry about, and we just do this um, now uh, k squared times. So k squared repeat repetitions of that. There's the k squared here. We do this k squared times. The k squared knocks at, uh, knocks that k squared here, and it doesn't notice the higher terms because they're higher ordering uh, in one over k. Okay, so that gives us um, uh, formulas that relate um, uh, very complicated formulas that relate uh, phenomena in the Lie algebra and phenomena in the group. So we can see, we compare these two, the Trotter one, addition in the Lie algebra in terms of, of multiplications in the group and uh, bracket in the Lie algebra in terms of multiplications in the group. So we can see how to relate the two. At this point we want to move into a different direction. Instead of expanding out our weird sum, which I don't think we're ever going to look at again, I think we'll never need weird sum. We can use Trotter product formula and commutator product formulas from now on. Uh, without worrying about the weird sum, uh, I think. Um, though it can be calculated out to higher order, but we won't worry about it. Um, what we're interested in now is trying to get some kind of global uh, theorems out of it. Um, and the, the big one we want is that uh, closed uh, subgroups of Lie groups are, uh, uh, are smooth embedded submanifolds embedded uh, Lie subgroups they're um, they're sub manifolds um, so this is is important because because this the, the input information here is very small closed means a closed as a set as a subset because a Lie group of course is a, a Lie group is a, is, a, is a manifold so it has a topology and so we can talk about closed subsets but closed subsets are very very um, complicated objects and have very little structure in a general manifold. So there's not much you get out of being a closed subset. But there's also not much you get out of being a subgroup. Subgroups can be quite horrible inside Lie groups. But the two put together um, are, are just what we need. So, uh, so this is a topological condition on a subset. This is an algebraic condition. And topology and algebra together bind up somehow and give you smoothness, which is surprising because smoothness is really calculus. It's really differentiating. And close doesn't give you the ability to differentiate. Subgroup doesn't give you the ability to differentiate. We need to somehow to put those two together, topology and algebra, to be able to take derivatives and see that things are actually smooth. And that's what's really rather surprising, that we can actually do that. OK, so let's see if we can figure out a proof for this. Um, I want to show closed subgroups are really nicely behaved. Um, and um, so we're going to um, try to go um, uh, in both directions. In fact, it's not obvious even the e what seems the easy direction. Take a smooth embedded Lie subgroup. You want to say it's a closed subgroup. That's not obvious either. So let's just recall that if if we had the real number line, um, just as a this is an, a parenthes parenthetic remark, it's not part of the proof. Um, if if m is the real number line, um, and then we take inside the real number line the inner interval, um, so we take some sort of s is uh, zero. Well, I'd say open zero one uh, contained in m. Then m s is an embedded uh, submanifold. Um, because every point in S looks locally like uh, like uh, like a, uh, the the vanishing of some functions in this case vanishing of no functions, so it is an embedded submanifold, but it's not closed. 
So in fact, there's already a difficult thing to prove going back this direction. If we assume we have a smooth embedded Lie subgroup, can we show that it's closed? And that's not obvious. So uh, then we the other, obviously the other direction is the harder one. If we have a closed subgroup, how do we show it's actually smooth, et cetera, and so on. So let's just try the easier direction first. Um, so we'll take H, contained in G, an embedded subgroup. And we want to show that it's closed. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take, um, let's let H bar be the closure of H. Um, so uh, I, I won't uh, prove it. I'll let you check that it's actually a subgroup. Uh, that H bar is a subgroup. The closure of H inside G is a subgroup. So you take a, any subgroup and take its closure, you always get a subgroup. Um, okay, so let's try um, to figure out why H is H bar. So we want the H to be close. We want H to be its closure H bar. So we'll pick some uh, Y in, in H bar. And then, um, so we can, uh, we know that H is embedded. Uh, so um, by being, to be embedded, what we know is therefore that there exists some uh, open uh, subset of G so that um, I want to say that uh, one should be in there, let's say, and um, uh, so one in there um, with U intersect H closed in a, in U. Why is that true? Um, what am I saying? I'm saying I have a I have a I have a, 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 an embedded subgroup. This is my H. Right? H bar is given by adding on the additional points to make it closed, and then I have the identity element. And what I'm saying is that because uh, embedded submanifold is given locally by the vanishing of some of some smooth functions. Uh, it's closed where the where it's given by the vanishing of some smooth functions. Um, so uh, so it's closed near the identity. So this is my U. Okay. Um, now uh, let's let uh, U inverse be defined to be the set of G inverse such that G is in U. The obvious notation. Um, and then what I want to say is I want to figure out why I can get uh, h bar to be to be equal to h. Um, so what I find is that y times uh, so y was my element of h bar. That's what I'm trying to figure out is in h. Uh, y times um, u inverse uh, is an open set around uh, y. So um, it must contain, uh, in, it must intersect, uh, um, intersects H, because it, after all, this guy is in H bar. It's in the closure of H. So a point in the closure, uh, every open set around it intersects the, the original H. Um, so, uh, so suppose that X is in Y U inverse. Um, that says, therefore, x can be written as y little u inverse for some u in u. Uh -huh. So, um, all right. So let's write that down again. So what we've got is we've got, um, we've got our picture. We've got some y, which is just outside of h, just in the closure. And then what we found is we found that um, we've got some x uh, is y u inverse. Um, and in other words, we can write that as x inverse y equals u is in u intersect h bar. Um, uh, so, um, which is uh, u intersect h. Um, uh, so, um, so uh, uh, x uh, inverse y um, is in H, and x is in H, so y is in H. And that's the proof of, well, that's the proof of, of this direction. Checked. Okay, so now we have to go uh, back the other way. This is the hard bit, the really long part of the proof for this lecture. Um, 
I want to go this way. And so we're supposing we have a H containing G is just a closed subgroup of a Lie group G. We're going to have to try and guess what its Lie algebra could be if it was a Lie group. Let's let uh, German H be the set of all uh, left invariant vector fields, or the set of all, let's say, the set of all A in G, such that the associated left invariant vector field um, uh, has flow, um, flow uh, preserves this closed subgroup H. So that's what we're going to guess to be its Lie algebra. And what we want to do is to show it's a Lie group and that that's its Lie algebra. In, in fact, it, preserving all of H is not, not, not necessarily the right thing to think about. You don't have to preserve all of H in order to, well, if you, if you preserve just part of H, you preserve all of H in the sense that um, uh, if, um, uh, if E to the TA is in H for all T, then um, E to the TA H is equal to H, of course, because it's a group. So you can multiply by its elements and stay inside it. In fact, that's if and only if. Um, so um, because you set, you, you, you have this, these guys have to be in H, the identity elements in here. So uh, so you can you can see that really it's good enough to just say that the flow lines of the uh, of these uh, through the identity of these um, exponentials, uh, one parameter subgroups, if you like, are, are actually in H. By, by the definition, uh, by this very definition, it's clear that this guy is closed under addition, or sorry, is closed under, sorry, not under addition, under scaling. Because if something has one parameter subgroup in here, you rescale the one parameter subgroup, you just go along it more quickly. Um, so it's, it's the same one parameter subgroup parameterized more rapidly. Um, so therefore, rescaling doesn't, doesn't do anything to us. Um, now, we can look at the Trotter product formula, um, and it tells us that we can essentially carry out addition um, by uh, repeated uh, multiplication in the group, um, and uh, by a large number of, of, of multiplications in the group. Um, so if we, if we use that, we immediately get that, um, and we can take limits because H is closed. We can take the limits because Trotter involves a, a limit. The limits are okay because H is closed, so you, you can take limits and you won't leave. And so you immediately get that H is closed under uh, plus. And then the commutator formula, in the same way, used exactly the same trick. Uh, the commutator formula says that um, that uh, you can take limits in the commutator formula. One side, the right-hand side of the commutator is entirely inside the group H. It's closed, so you can take that limit, and then therefore you get the left-hand side is going on inside this little H, and so you get uh, H is closed under a bracket. So that's a Lie subalgebra of of uh, German G, so little h. German H is at least of algebra of German G. So now we have to examine, um, we've got uh, the, the, the German H behaving rather well. We want to examine what does this H, uh, we want to see what the relationship is between the German H and the and, and the group H, um, the Lie algebra and the group. We want to show that it is the Lie algebra of that group. Um, let's suppose we, we examine it very near the, the, the origin. So let's take H1, H2, dot, 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 going to the identity in H. Uh, so we have a sequence and a convergent sequence of elements. Um, if we, we go far enough down the sequence, we're very, very close to the identity. So we can then start writing the elements in the sequence as exponentials. They have logarithms. Ha is the log of the Hj's. And that only happens once we get close enough to the identity, but that's okay. We can uh, just throw out the ones where they're not close, that they're not close enough. Um, so then, um, now let's take uh, any inner product, a positive definite inner product on G. So G is now thought of as Euclidean space. It's a vector space after all, so it's not scary to think of it as just Euclidean space with a normal inner product, usual inner product. Um, and so, um, so what we can do is to look at um, directions um, 
we take these AJs and we divide by how long they are in the inner product. That gives us a direction in the unit sphere. So here's the um, here's our Lie algebra. Gee, it's a finite dimensional vector space. We put an inner product on it, so now it has a notion of a unit sphere. And we take these vectors in it, and we actually normalize them to be on the unit sphere. So that's a normalized vector. So it sits on the unit sphere. It just keeps track of the direction, not the quantity of the, not the, not the, the, um, the length of the vector. So um, now, uh, if we um, if we look at this guy, it's the uh, AJs have to be going to zero. Um, so um, what we want to do is to um, is to understand what happens as we take limits of the directions of these ajs. Now, as as as, as for for small enough or very small uh, magnitude of aj, um, what we can say is we can approximate that this thing is a very large real number. It's in between two integers. Uh, two large integers, and it's not not too you know relatively not not that far off from from either of them. So what we can do is to say that um, we can say that a j divided by norm a j, well, is uh, is well approximated by uh, some integer multiple. It's approximately n j a j, n j uh, um, some integer. Um, why is that? Because uh, because the length is approximately some some integer, and we divide it off. Um, we write this guy as this unit vector, um, and approximate by um, uh, n times uh, the unit vector should be. Um, sorry, for very very small, it's reciprocal. <laughs> it's approximately an integer. Uh, it's approximately. Um, it's approximately the reciprocal of some integer. Okay, so this gives us a uh, that this guy is approximately an integer multiple of this tiny vector, very tiny vector, unit vector, uh, approximately integer multiple. Um, and so what we end up with is that um, uh, we can um, get these directions. These are unit vectors. Um, so um, let's say these are unit vectors, um, and the uh, sphere is compact. And so they must uh, converge after maybe taking a subsequence. After perhaps taking a subsequence, they converge to some unit vector. Okay, so they're they're getting closer and closer to some unit vector, but they're also very close to being integer multiples of the a's. And so what we can say, therefore, is that if when we exponentiate them, we can say that the exponential of the aj's to the power of nj's. That's what we get when we exponentiate this guy. Um, is uh, approximately uh, the exponential of u. Okay, so that gives us um, that we're uh, we we don't know what the ages are doing. They're going to zero, but if we make appropriate powers of them, they approximately go to something in this exponential of this unit sphere. I should maybe, I should maybe point out that we can make sure the exponential of the unit sphere is 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 wherever we want because we get to pick the inner product. So we don't really have to worry too much about. Uh, taking logarithms or whatever on these unit vectors, we'd make the inner product where we, we whatever we like. So the, the the crucial observation at this point is that of course the, these guys um, are in H, and therefore when we take p large powers of them, we're also in H. Um, but H is closed, uh, so so these guys approach that guy. They approach this guy. Um, so that guy must therefore be in H. Okay. And uh, since exponential of u is in h, well, by the same argument, you can essentially do the same thing for any rescaling. Um, of the u by any constant factor, and so um, uh, e to the exponential of any multiple of u is in h, and therefore uh, u is in this Lie algebra. So what have we done? We started off by taking a sequence. Let's go back over the, the result. We started with a sequence. Um, we started with a sequence of elements uh, that were in H. We said it H1, H2, da, 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 uh, went going to the identity element, and these are all in H. Okay, we're in this closed subgroup, and we've got these elements going to the identity element. We can we can write them 
as exponentials of some AJs. Um, what we found is that the AJs over normed AJs normalized have unit length approximately, well, after maybe taking a subsequence, they go to something that's in here. Um, so they approach. Okay, so we're getting um, some relationship between uh, convergence in the group and some convergence in the Lie algebra that we propose to be the Lie algebra of that group. Now what we want to do is we want to think about, so we have this, this subgroup H, it has this, this thing which we've called German H, which we think is probably going to be a good candidate for its Lie algebra. It lives inside the larger uh, German G, so as a linear subspace of this vector space. So we've got this subspace at little h inside this space g. Let's pick some complement v plus h equals g. Pick a complement v, doesn't matter how you do it. Um, so if you have a sequence of vectors in v, um, uh, then um, and then going to zero, uh, then uh, di their direction stays away from stays away from this this German H. They, 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 they are up because we're doing this way inside V. So so therefore um, uh, their exponentials stay outside because uh, the German H was the stuff whose exponentials go inside. Those exponentials uh, on V stay outside of uh, H. Okay. Um, So, um, so there's a ball on which this which just works. Well, exponentials of small stuff in, uh, let's say, I shouldn't say v, but really small vectors in v stay outside h. So there exists some ball um, in g, say b contained in g, a ball in in it in our inner product, um, so that um, in which uh, in which uh, exponential uh, keeps uh, v intersect that ball outside of uh, capital H. We take very small balls, um, small balls, uh, b inside H and bv inside, inside, say inside v, small enough balls that, that their product stays inside that ball. Then, um, then what we get is we get a map, which is A and B, in B ball here, across the ball here. So in our picture, this is um, taking, so we have our subalgebra and some little ball in the subalgebra. Then we have our vector space V and some little ball in the vector space V. Um, and if you make small enough vectors and then you exponentiate them, exponential A, exponential B, um, uh, then uh, that's a diffeomorphism, um, and it identifies um, uh, the elements in this guy with uh, this is going to H cross some exponential of B V. Um, and so so it's going to uh, actually exponentiate this guy into H and this guy outside H, and so it's actually going to give you a chart. Um, so it's a uh, embedded submanifold. Um, so th this is going to identify this with a product so that H, capital H, looks like a little ball in, these ch in this chart. Right? You can think of the A and the B as being, pr as being variables, various variables in a vector space, and we get a little chunk of the variables that parameterize H, a little chunk of them that parameterize the, the directions across H. And so that's exactly saying that it's a, uh, an embedded submanifold. near uh, the identity element, and then near any other element, you just left translate to the identity element, and you can get it to uh, produce a chart near any, anybody else. Okay, so that's the big, giant, and very difficult theorem um, that enables us to understand um, how to relate a simple condition being closed subgroup to a really difficult condition of being, uh, of being a smooth embedded subgroup. As a serious example, well, almost all of our examples are examples of this theorem. Um, because uh, we, we constructed all sorts of Lie groups, but we didn't really have to check that there were Lie groups because we had this theorem. Um, so if we take, um, if we take uh, 
the uh, symmetries of any, let's say, you know, quadratic form, form uh, in any variables, cubic form, and so on and so forth, or whatever we like, they form uh, a closed subgroup because they're continuous from a closed subgroup of the, some general linear group of some vector space. So in some vector space, you pick some, you know, some algebraic structure you like, some, I don't know, algebra structure, some inner product, some cubic form, whatever thing, whatever kind of algebra things you want to do, and then you get a closed subgroup. You could look for the, the linear transformations that preserve a closed subset, for example. Um, so, and every closed subgroup is an embedded Lie subgroup. So that gives you lots and lots and lots of Lie subgroups, including all, all of our examples. And some, some more uh, algebraic examples, you know, when you worked in algebra, you probably saw things like uh, the center of a group is the, um, is the set of elements of the group that commute with all the other elements for all h and g, commutes with every element, the elements of the group that commute with all the other elements. Um, or, for example, the, the um, centralizer of a subset, if you take s contained in the group, the centralizer of the subset is simply the set of elements of g, such that g h is h g, just for those elements in the subset. And these are... Um, for elements in the subset. These are closed subgroups of G for any Lie group G because this is a set of equations. Each equation uh, is satisfied. It's continuous because the multiplication is, we know, continuous. And so it's a continuous equation, equation of continuous functions. And so its solution is always from a closed subset by continuity. The same is true here. So it's con these, these are closed subgroups, and therefore um, they are Lie subgroups. They're embedded, smooth Lie subgroups. Similarly, we can look at the normalizer. Um, so these centralizers and this kind of thing are very, very important in algebra. Um, so, and of course, the, this ZG is, is ZS when S is G, obviously. Um, if you have a, a subset, you can say that normalizer of the subset is the set of elements uh, G and G such that it takes the subset um, uh, to itself. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's going to be also a, a closed condition. Um, so uh, because it's going to be a bunch of equations, so if S is uh, closed, it's clearly a closed condition. And so um, so this would be a closed subgroup again. So you get lots of nice examples from algebra of of, of um, uh, smooth Lie subgroups. So, for example, one, one of the things we did um, was to look at uh, the special linear group, SL, say N, let's say C, doesn't matter, it could be C, could be R, doesn't matter. It's the uh, kernel of the determinant. It's the set of elements of determinant 1. And I like to use the word kernel because I'm trying to think in terms of, of algebra, right? We take uh, N by N complex matrices, general linear, so it means all, all the matrices uh, that are invertible, uh, n by n complex matrices, that's n by n complex matrices, um, in, which are invertible, so that it forms a group, the general linear group. We have the determinant as a morphism of groups to the non-zero complex numbers. It's on to, so the image of this is the kernel of this. Uh, its kernel is SLNC, so the image of this is the kernel of this, and then I can put a 1 here because the image of this is the kernel of this. So um, so that's how we write these sequences of, of group morphisms down. They're called exact sequences. The image of this is the kernel of this. The image of this is the kernel of this. The image of this is the kernel of this. So, um, okay, so we have this nice description. And you can see it's closed because this is a continuous map. Determines continuous. And so um, the set on which it's equal to 1 is a closed set. And so it's a, um, that's a closed subgroup. And therefore, it's an embedded smooth Lie subgroup. Another um, trivial observation here about the um, about the, the, the subgroups uh, and, and their Lie algebras. So lemma is that um, the Lie algebra of the kernel um, 
uh, is the kernel of the of the derivative. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that we we take some take as usual. We have some groups. It's a morphism. We want to find uh, the kernel of that. So we have some kernel contained in here. Um, so if this is the kernel of this uh, this morphism of groups. And what we know is that phi of e to the t a is e to the t phi prime of one a. Um, and uh, so uh, phi prime of one a equals zero if and only if phi e to the t a is one for all t. Um, and uh, so that's if and only if e to the t a is in the kernel. Um, uh, so, um, but we figured out that the kernel um, is closed by um, because its definition is that it's the set of uh, well, this is a continuous map, so the points at which it's one are are a closed subset. So it's closed, and so it's embedded, and so um, it's Lie algebra, which is some fancy script K equals the Lie algebra of K is exactly the set of vectors such that uh, this guy is in K. Um, so it's exactly the the um, vectors whose flows lie in it. Um, so that gives you the the ability to calculate out um, uh, to identify the Lie algebra of the kernel. Um, of, of, uh, even though we may not be able to actually do these, these maps may be very complicated, so finding the kernel explicitly may be very terrible, very difficult, but if you can differentiate at the identity of this map, then you can have a chance of, of actually solving the equation for the kernel. For the rest of this lecture, I don't want to consider anything quite so difficult. Um, this is a very difficult theorem. Now let's think about something more elementary, but closely related, um, some implications really of this idea of um, closed subgroups being embedded. Um, <coughs> we want to somehow get interesting actions of groups, and um, one of the most remarkable is the so-called adjoint representation. You could say that one of the problems we run into in dealing with Lie groups is that we want to do everything all at once. We want to be able to handle all Lie groups. Um, we've said, for example, that um, if you wanted to pick a point on a Lie group, the obvious point to pick is the identity because it's the identity element of a group is available on every group. In the same way, we'd like to be able to treat all Lie groups uh, in the same vein and using the same machinery. Um, and that's not always straightforward to do. But there are certain operations we have on all the Lie groups. One of them is that we have the left translation. So left translation by, let's write our elements of our group as x's and y's and so on instead of g's. Left translation x, y is x, y. Right translation x, y is y, x. Um, this leads naturally to um, the observation that if we left translate x and right translate z, let's say y, um, first of all, it makes uh, makes that into what is that? That's x of um, this one is y, z. But by associativity, that's just x, y, z. So left translation by x, right translation by anything z is the same as doing them in the opposite order. <coughs> that's just asso exactly associativity, the commutativity of left and right multiplications. So that's rather surprising. It means we have a large collection of operations on a group. The group acts in itself by these left translations. It acts in itself by the right translations. And associativity is exactly the statement that those commute. In other words, it has a large collection of operations on itself which commute with one another, which is a bit surprising because it's a as a group, it doesn't have to be commuting, but it has this large collection of commuting operations. It naturally leads us to wonder what happens if we left translate by x, but then right translate by x inverse. Um, in, you know, in our basic picture of our group, um, we take the identity element uh, and then we left translate by x, uh, we end up with some element x. But then if we right translate by x inverse, it takes us back again. Um, so we're ending up with some kind of loop. So we can see anyway that 
uh, left translation by x followed by right translation by x inverse um, takes the group to itself and it takes the identity element to the identity element which is very surprising so it somehow twists the group around in some way so we'll call this out this um, the adjoint operation um, so we'll define add x it takes g to g simply to be exactly this operation add x um, equals left translation by x right translation by x inverse or in other words add x y is x y x inverse so that gives us an operation that does something rather strange to the group because it fixes the identity element and it's defined for every x in the group so we have a, not just one adjoint operation but have an adjoint for every every element x in the group we have an operation on the whole group that fixes the identity so we kind of wonder what that looks like because it fixes the identity it has a special property that we can differentiate it at the identity so we define this guy add um, add x on the Lie algebra um, which is also called add x unfortunately the tradition is to say that if you have this operation and it takes one to one then it has of course a derivative uh, at the identity as you say that's also called also called add x um, and that operation because this guy is taking one to one this is a linear approximation on it so it must be an operation that is a linear map of the Lie algebra um, um, given by simply given by add x applied to uh, and again I'm taking the different derivative and then uh, at the identity and I'm giving that also the name add x so this add x is the derivative at the identity of this add x and that's something we'll do very often we'll often write the derivative of some operation by the same name as the operation um, it would be confusing uh, very confusing in calculus but it's very uh, clear in, in the Lie group theory. It doesn't seem to cause a problem. So again, what is this? This is, well, you take left translation by x and differentiate it on vectors, and then you take right translation by x and differentiate it on vectors. A little star means, of course, the derivative. Um, and then you apply that to this vector. Oh, sorry, by x inverse. And then you, uh, then you do this. Um, so that's our add operation. And... Um, we can say a lot about it because we know a lot about how left and right translation works. It's very much just unwinding. There can't be a deep proof about any of the statements I'm about to make because all you could possibly do was to unwind the definition of left and right um, translation. So you can prove various elementary um, results about them, like, for example, right translation of, um, of, uh, of, a, of this uh, left invariant vector field, um, it's left invariant, but it's not right invariant. So what happens if you right translate something that's left invariant? It doesn't know what to do because it, it doesn't want to be right invariant. It isn't. Um, what happens instead is that it changes to something else, and it changes to add x. So this is useful. We're finding out what happens when you do the wrong operation. This is left invariant, but what happens if you hit it with a right uh, translation instead of a left one? It transforms like that, and I'll leave you to check that. Um, now, um, now we said so again. We said that add uh, x takes g to g by taking y to x y x inverse, and then its derivative add x prime at the identity is also called add x, and it takes uh, the Lie algebra to itself. So it must be an element of the of the well the linear transformation there must be an element of the general linear group of the Lie algebra why by general linear because of course uh, add x let me just write down here add x inverse is of course add of x inverse um, I should prove for that add but it's also true therefore for this add as well both senses so we have this original add x operation we differentiated at the identity we also call that by the same name add x which is perhaps as a perhaps confusing in calculus but it's okay here um, and its inverse is just given by inverting the x. Um, it's not a very exciting operation. Uh, well, you can calculate out lots of examples. Um, now we want to say, well, then what happens? What's the dependence on x? So if we have the, in, any x in the group, we're mapping it to add x. Uh, and then this in this this second sense, in this sense of add x, uh, put that in here. That add x 
is an element of the general linear group of the Lie algebra. Okay. So what we've done is to define an operation associating to every group, every Lie group, we've associated some linear transformation on, s on its Lie algebra. And that's not obvious how that works. Right? What we've done is to say, if I uh, take, geometrically, if I take um, at the identity some vector a, and then I left translate over to some point x, it becomes some other vector left translated a. Then I right translate back again um, from this guy back to here, and it becomes something else again. This is this add x a. So you left translate out and right translate back. And obviously on an abelian Lie group, left and right are the same. So if you left translate and right translate back, so g abelian, um, left translate x and right translate x are the same thing. Um, so add x is the identity matrix. So for an abelian Lie group, it doesn't do anything. And so in some sense, it's measuring kind of the non abelianness of our group. We're saying that to each element of the group, we have a linear transformation. It's this linear transformation. Go back out with your take root tangent vector. Take it back out with uh, with this Lx and, and return again with the Rx inverse. We go out and come back again. Comparing the left translation and the right translation. You can see what we're doing exactly comparing them to see how, how similar they are. If they're very, very close to one another, then this should be a, a linear transformation with very close to the identity. In this case, they're exactly equal, so it is the identity. So it measures a kind of, of non abelianness of the group. Um, now, it's also a smooth map of, well, let's go back and look at it here. This means that we've mapped the group to the general linear group by an operation which we'll just call add. This is all very, very standard notation. Um, it's the operation on the group which associates to each element x the linear transformation add x, which associates to each element a the left translation by, whoops, uh, sorry, we're out of the uh, left translation, uh, right translation, x inverse uh, a. So that's a linear transformation on tangent vectors, and it's maybe non-trivial. Again, this is our picture of it here. We've taken the tangent vector, gone out with the left translation to pull it out here, then we push it back again with the right translation inverse. Um, so that's the operation of the add. And it's an operation that, that goes from here to here, and I'll leave you to check that it's a it's actually a group operation. Um, it's a Lie group morphism. In other words, taking this group to this group. Um, and as I said, it's, if G is abelian, then it's actually trivial, so it's not interesting. So it kind of measures, in some sense, the non-abelianness of the G by saying how wildly does it linearly transform things when you when you carry out the left versus the right. How wildly different do they are they to each other? Um, and I'll leave you to calculate out. You can do some nice nice examples. The um, one by one, um, they're called S three, the unit quaternions, which I've also called the notes SP one. Um, you can easily calculate out what it is, um, that it's just um, the obvious uh, multiplication operation. It's um, uh, add x of quaternion y is x, y, x inverse in quaternions. Um, so it's this very easy example. Um, and you can also work it out for rotation matrices and try and figure out what is the adjoint operation. Um, so it's nice to see that it has some kind of explicit computations in some simple examples. Um, but what we're really interested in is the deeper notion of what it gives us. Um, we want to understand what we can do with it. Um, I just want to point out a, a, some facts about it. Um, uh, an ideal, well now we're really getting into algebra, an ideal uh, of uh, uh, the Lie algebra G is a um, subalgebra. So in other words, it's mul closer to multiplying and adding. Uh, let's say a subalgebra, uh, what do I want to call it, H, G. But it's not just a subalgebra. It's a subalgebra which is uh, sticky, uh, sticky in a certain sense. What do I mean by sticky? Uh, can I even write the word sticky? Um, uh, what do I mean by sticky? I mean that the bracket of anything in G and, and uh, anything in H is always 
something in H. So when you bracket things from outside to with things from inside, you stay in, you pull inside. You take an object from outside of H and an object from inside H. You bracket them together. You pull yourself into H. It sticks into H. So elements of H stick things from outside H to be stuck into H. Um, and that's the standard definition of ideal from from algebra. And so you can check that. Um, so it's a problem that uh, if you have H containing G connected, uh, Lee subgroup, um, uh, and G is also connected, so H and G are both connected, um, then um, H uh, is normal. It's a normal subgroup if and only if um, its Lie algebra uh, is an ideal. Sticky. Um, so it's normal. Uh, this is really the equation of being normal in the world of, of algebras. So unfortunately, we've got this terminology of normal subgroup in, in group theory. We've got the term ideal in algebra theory, and they really do more or less correspond to essentially the same concept, uh, which is really what we're finding out here. Again, this is something I'll let you prove. I'm not going to prove it. But it, it is unfortunate. It's also even more unfortunate that uh, the term normal is not used by the physicists and with engineers and so on, that the terminology of group theory has, has not become entirely standardized. Um, but we'll, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Um, this lecture is certainly more than long enough. Um, so um, Next time we want we want to think about how Lie groups act because the real reason for studying groups is to think of them as symmetries of objects. The reason for studying Lie groups is to think of them as symmetries of differential equations, or of problems in mathematical physics. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you can go back the other direction and say, how would you understand a Lie group? Well, you understand it by how it acts on things. But how would you understand how it acts on things? Well, you'd understand how it is, what kind of structure it has. So we sort of play the game in both directions. Lie group actions are useful to understand Lie groups, but they're also uh, useful because they're the only reason why we study Lie groups in the first place. Why do we care? Because we care that they act as symmetries of various problems in geometry and physics and engineering and chemistry and so on.